Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to talk about Bad Moon Rising by Sherilyn McQueen, formerly known as Sherilyn Kenyon. And we're going to talk kind of non-spoilery thoughts and opinions up front, then I'm going to kind of give a bit of a breakdown of the story and go into detail about some of the really, really cool things that she does in this book that I think have really interesting ramifications for her entire series. So with that being said, please make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And let's begin. <laughs> So, Bad Moon Rising. Bad Moon Rising is one of the more interesting books in Sherilyn Kenyon's Were Hunter or Sherilyn McQueen's Were Hunter universe. This book actually sits, it, to me, it's kind of the meat and the sandwich of these three books that all, all the events basically take place at the same time. So, in this story, we follow Amy and Fang. They are the, of course, titular, like, not supposed to be the get together, but of course will end up together kind of romance relationship because that is what Sherilyn does in pretty much all of her stories. It's always centered around a will-they-won't-they they situation. And in this situation, we have a werewolf, or wolf were Categoria, a wolf that has the ability to turn into a human and, you know, shapeshift back and forth. And we have a Categoria bear, who, same deal, is a bear that can turn into a human and stuff like that. But because wolf and bear don't really, you know, won't make children or whatever, they're not capable of breeding, the union is, you know, frowned upon. So even their interest in each other is like a big no-no and stuff. And Amy herself is the only daughter of this large, very prestigious clan of bears. So she's essentially the equivalent of a princess. So whoever she mates with, it is very important that she mates with a bear of, you know, stature or whatever and produce as many heirs as possible to keep their line going because their entire family is matriarchal. It all goes down the female line and she's the only girl. So her, who she dates, who she's with is incredibly important. So the idea that she would end up with a wolf being unable to have any biological children is like devastating to her family, specifically her mother. While Sherilyn often makes her stories like purely about the relationship because this is a romance genre, these books are pure like mostly romance. This book to me has the most other stuff apart from the romance. There is a large in depth story that covers so many different characters and so many different areas of the world building that she creates that I think it's just really fascinating. And it you can honestly take out the romance part of the story and it still kind of flows perfectly. Granted, the romance part is kind of the heart of the story, but there is a lot more to it that just kind of works in a really, really well-developed way. Sherilyn's writing is really, really well done. She has this way of adding so much characterization to each of her characters. Like, she does this thing that's, like, purely implicit characterization. She doesn't do the, um, these, this character has these traits. It's not even described by other characters. It's like every line of dialogue that she gives her characters often express these different characters, character characterizations character characteristics yeah that's the word <laughs> so it's like almost every line of dialogue her characters have expressed some sort of characteristic that informs you about who they are it's a really interesting way of doing that i i think i've only really experienced through her writing and it just kind of gives you this sense of knowing these characters on a deep level that's rarely seen in my opinion it, you get their level of sarcasm you get their snark you get their passion their fears their insecurities and all of this through every single line of dialogue that they have and it just comes across so so well i think it's some of the best writing for characters i've seen like period <laughs> like especially in fantasy the pacing of the story is also really well done. We kind of get to a point where everything just kind of hits a crescendo and we learn all this new information about pretty much the world and the way it works. Like there's different little doors into other pockets of her world building that she kind of opens in the story. And that's really cool. Given that so many different things happen in this story, the pacing work that Sherilyn does on the story is actually really impressive because like I said, it kind of crosses over three separate books and you kind of can feel it, especially if you're familiar with, familiar with the other two books. Like you can feel those different instances, but she kind of does it in such a way where it's like, yes, this is going on, but we're going to shove it to the side. Yes, this is going on, we're going to shove it to the side and focus on this stuff. So it's like very well realized the way her priorities are very clear in the story. You 
can really see it and kind of feel it coming through the characters. So I think this story is really well done. It's Yes, it's a romance story, and those are often like frowned upon unless you're really into the genre. But if you're into fantasy and world building and you're okay with the, like love story stuff that kind of branches on erotica, to be honest, um, you'll really, really like this story. And to me, granted, I have a huge bias too because I love werewolves. And it's ironic because these are probably my least favorite werewolves because they're they're just basically shapeshifters i don't know of all werewolves that exist i really like these because of their origin but they're not as interesting as other werewolves i don't know i might have to break that down in like a video or something the different types of werewolves in my opinions on them or something so yeah that might be coming in the future let me know what you think about that in the comments down below would you like to see a video like that let me know about that so yeah, with that being said, let's go ahead and jump into spoilers so I can kind of break down the story a little bit more. So if you care about spoilers, then you probably don't want to listen to the rest of this video. But if you haven't read it and don't even care about spoilers and just interested in the story, then please continue to listen. So with that being said, we're going to jump into spoilers for Bad Moon Rising by Sherilyn McQueen. So... So one of our main protagonists in the story is Fang. Him and his brother Vane are basically outcasts within their own family. Their father had a horrible relationship with their mother and as a result their father kind of takes it all out on them and basically sees them as lesser and not worthy of the pact and everything. And despite all of this hatred they continue to protect the pact and all that stuff but they also have a very very strong relationship with their sister. So mostly because they love their sister so much, they tolerate all of the physical and mental and psychological abuse they get from their father and the rest of the pack members. So in one of the situations, basically a day in the life kind of thing happens where a lot of the females in their pack are pregnant. So they kind of go to the, you know, they go and find food and they go out to the bar sanctuary, which is the one we talked about in the previous video on Unleash Tonight. It is a neutral ground for all the were creatures. So, you know, considering the were hunters and the the, the wolf wares and the werewolves always are fighting and killing each other. The two types of species are always fighting and killing. But they can go to this location which is neutral ground. It is protected and nobody is allowed to fight there. So they can basically go there. You know, it's a meeting hub for all the different species or whatever. So they go there to get food and stuff. And of course, this is where Fang and Amy meet. This is where the two characters end up meeting each other. They have a little meet cute. But it kind of works out in a situation where, of course, because wolves and bears don't like each other, they end up like butting heads or whatever. But that's essentially is our first interaction between the two. So sometime later, Fang and Fang end up going back home and they're hanging out with their sister and stuff and because there's constantly fights between the two types of were creatures their pack goes off and fights a bunch of um, other types of wares and basically their sister's husband and mate and bonded mate ends up getting killed and as a result because of their bonding she ends up dying so they suffered this great loss pretty much short in the story like very very quickly in the story and they're you know incredibly devastated by it and as a result their father basically uses this as a way to scapegoat them in order to get rid of them because he's hated them forever so he blames the entire situation on them says it's all their fault because their associations with the dark hunters and stuff and so they basically do this ritualistic um, sacrifice execution thing where they tie them up in the swamp where the demons, the vampiric like creatures that suck blood and people's souls out. Like, so they left them there in order for them to be eaten. And basically when the demons come, they end up all fighting and stuff and they kind of get out. But Fang, part of his soul is snatched away, which causes the rest of his soul to basically fall into the nether realm and his body basically is neither alive nor dead. So he appears as if he's unconscious and he can't wake up. And Vane thinks that this is because he's in major grief because of their sister. So he ends up taking it very harshly and thinks it's because his brother is weak. So Fang is literally in hell, getting chased and attacked by demons, fighting demons all the time, nonstop, 24-7. And he's trying to contact people through dreams, but everyone's ignoring him, including his brother. Until eventually he goes to Amy's dream, the bear at Sanctuary, who hears him and listens to him and actually goes and tries to do something about it. So I find that very interesting, especially considering their early interactions was mostly negative. But even though, you know, we get from both of their POV, it's very clear that they're both incredibly attracted to each other. So it makes a lot of sense, though, that she would act on it when she figures it out. Even though his brother himself thought it was just like a stress dream or something and didn't believe it was his brother actually reaching out to him, begging for help and stuff. So 
Amy goes on this entire mission in order to try to help him. She eventually goes into hell physically itself, but she ends up in a situation where she's almost killed when she gets ambushed by a bunch of demons. So Fang being, of course, in love with her, but not being able to acknowledge it and also being incredibly grateful that she would come here to like help him, he ends up selling his soul to the son of the devil in order to save her. So he saves her, sells his soul, but the nature of selling his soul means that he becomes a demon hunter. He becomes what's known as a hell chaser, which is someone that hunts demons and sends them back to their their specific hell realm. Because there's all sorts of different hell realms. Pretty much every religion with a hell, like, it exists. So they need to get sent back to their appropriate hell realm or whatever. So he has sold his soul for this woman, but he never tells her. So it creates this entire interesting, like, under layer dynamic kind of thing. So he ends up being brought out of his coma, and it creates all this, like, it kind of starts this little friction between him and his brother, because he resents his brother for not helping when he was begging for help, which, in my opinion, is completely understandable, but at the same time, it's like, you should understand that he didn't know that that was you, and all this kind of stuff, I don't know. So it's just, it's, the emotions of hurt and pain are very understandable on both sides and you can't really blame either of them for feeling the way that they do. So, in the time that um, Fang was in the Hell Realm, we basically have our other two books. So, in that entire time, he's unconscious and fighting demons, and then Amy goes to try to help him and everything. Um, Vane, his brother, is basically by his bedside and stuff, trying to get him to wake up, and then eventually he just kind of has to leave because, for one, there was a conflict that he was involved in in Sanctuary, and if you fight, you're banned, so he got kicked out, and he eventually, as a result of this, fi as a result of this finds his mate. So, um, Vane finds Bride, who is his mate, who is a human, and that pretty much is his own thing. That is the story Night Play, I believe. So, it's an entire separate book. So, we learn everything that Vane was doing while Fang was in a coma. And I think that's really, really interesting. So, all while he's also in this coma, there's a lot of, like, tension and stuff brewing at Sanctuary. There's this impending war between the bears and this pack of werewolves and these uh, panthers and just these other creatures and just a lot of the culmination of the bad blood that has been like seeded throughout the pretty much the history of this location is now starting to come to the forefront and as a result of these different lies and manipulations done by amy's mother they end up losing their writ of protection from the god like savitar savitar is a police policeman for the gods essentially if the gods fight Savitar goes in between them and say shut up so that's essentially who he is so when they lose their protection over their neutral location basically it means you know all rules are done so anybody can come in and attack them so it basically creates the situation where this giant war is brewing and eventually it does all pop off but this is where we kind of get to see a lot of the expansive world building because all of the allies that have ever crossed this location ends up showing up in order to help everyone. They end up helping the Bear family fight off the all the people that want to come and kill them. So this gigantic battle ensues and it's amazing. It's really cool because almost everyone has powers. Actually, everyone has powers and very interesting powers. So it just comes off as an interesting visual. Even though Sherilyn doesn't do a whole lot of work in describing the action, she kind of does a little bit, but not to the degree that some other writers will. But there is enough tools that she kind of gives you that allows your imagination to run wild and you kind of make it up in your own head. At least I do. So I still really, really enjoy it. So all this time, Fang has basically while all this stuff is brewing and coming to a head, Fang is now starting to secretly do his demon hunter stuff. But he was barely given any useful information from Thorn, the son of the devil. And he then kills a demon that he's not supposed to kill. When he kills the demon's physical body, its soul jumps into his body and possesses him. And shortly after this possession, people start dying. Humans and other were hunters and stuff start dying. And he basically wakes up with no memory. He has these blackouts and stuff. And he wakes up in the location of one of the murders. And he has like blood in his mouth and stuff. So he's basically like, dang, I'm probably guilty and everything. So he kind of goes on the run. So we then spend another chunk of time where everyone's separated from each other. And there's like this time jump where he's basically on the run and everyone's trying to figure out what's going on. So Savitar, since he is also like the police of their species, he is basically saying like Fang has to come and answer for his crimes because basically at this point, everybody said, yes, he is the killer. Like he needs to be dealt with. So 
he basically put out an edict that says that either Fang shows up and face judgment or I'll kill his entire family. And, you know, of course, it's very hard to deal with something like that. So Fang goes and basically answers, you know, answers his judgment or whatever. He's ready to go sacrifice his life to protect Amy, to protect Vane, to protect Bride, to protect his newfound brother Fury, to like protect, you know, all those people and stuff. But what he didn't know is that Savitar was setting him up because the demon that possessed him can only be exercised by an action that is incredibly selfless. So by him sacrificing or being willing to sacrifice his life for his family, that is an incredibly selfless act. So it immediately expels the demon. And then you find out Savitar was just doing that just to help him out or whatever. So he wasn't actually going to kill anyone. But he does permanently revoke the license from Sanctuary, which causes the giant war. So it's kind of a good and a bad thing. So I really like this story. I think it's really interesting. It's so very detailed. There's so much other little stuff that kind of happens in it, but it's really, really good. I really recommend it. Even the romance stuff is kind of minor. I'm not negative on it, but I know a lot of people don't really care for that kind of stuff. So it's really interesting to me that she was able to create this story where the even though it's a big romantic story it's a romance it's a love story the love is there you feel the love that these characters have for each other you root for them you want them to be together you feel depressed when they feel like they can't be together and stuff so it all really works but she managed to pack so much other interesting stuff in here that you're not just like oh we're again with the will they want they will they want they stuff so just this is one of the best examples of her massive massive world building and i just think it's so so well done so i can't recommend this book enough so yeah let's go ahead and wrap this up um i really enjoyed this story i hope you did if you've read it if you've read it let me know what you thought about it in the comments down below how do you feel about the the way in which it's almost convenient that at the very end after like having um fang Fang and Amy basically give up on the concept of if they have sex, then they'll possibly be mated, but they're not supposed to be together, so they don't have sex for most of the book. They pretty much give up on that concept and start having sex, but they never get their mated marks. So they assume, oh, we're not destined mates. Maybe we're just people that are in love with each other. And so they kind of just go off in that direction. But sometime later, like way after the fact, they've already started having sex and it's just like a random day, they both suddenly get their mating marks and they're officially mated and they can bond each other. So they do a soul bond. So to me, that feels a little convenient. It's like, it's rare that this will happen, at least when the story is about the main two characters trying to get together. It's rare that they will not like each other or not end up as mates or not you know be together basically it's there's never a situation like with fang's parents where he is his dad's category his mom's arcadian so they immediately hate each other and they basically only get together because otherwise their sex don't work unless it's with each other so they basically kind of do it begrudgingly and then separate like we never get a story where something like that happens at least not yet so let me know if you feel like them getting together even though they weren't destined mates feels a little too convenient because to me it feels a little too convenient so yeah let me know about that in the comments down below make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and i will talk to y'all next time peace